Okay, so for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. I was, a, I was gonna start by saying that I know that there are, um, there are other proposals from the interested parties and I'm aware of those and I'm also aware that they are not in agreement. There is no consensus between the parties. So rather than try and put all of the suggestions in a draft, I just put in the draft what the committee had discussed and agreed on the last time we talked about this. So, um, and, let, er, and let the interested parties talk about what they would I, like to see. I don't think the committee agreed on them, but. I, no, right, and that's why, that's why I have them all in brackets to yeah. indicate that these are all decisions that need to be made yeah. by the committee. <clears throat> This is 1.1. 1.1, yep. So yeah. section one is, um, is a maintenance portion of the maintenance statute. Um, and the only change here is to page two. Um, this is the list of things that the court uh, can consider in making a maintenance award. Um, and subsection six here provides that one of the things the court should consider is the ability of the spouse um, from whom maintenance is being sought to meet his or her reasonable needs, and we've just added the phrase at the standard of living established during the civil marriage. What does that mean? Um, it means that the court has to consider um, the standard of living not only for the spouse who um, is seeking maintenance, but also whether or not the spouse that would be paying the maintenance could also maintain his or her standard of living established during the marriage. So that other piece about the spouse is just in a part of the statute that you don't have here? Um, the other part, say that again, the part? The, in, in the other draft, there was um, the piece that spoke to the, the payee being kept at their standard of living. That's your, your, your uh, that's that, yeah, that, that's that wasn't taken two. out. That was, it's, that's in current language. Yes. Okay. It's still there, and I think the, the idea was to add some add that phrase so it would also be a consideration taken for the, the mm -hmm. spouse who is, would be paying. Get okay. no, mm -hmm. um, so section two is the statute that out. relates to a modification of a maintenance award. Oh, um, I'm sorry, Bryn, before you go on. Mm -hmm. So this uh, subsection, guidelines? Yeah, the guidelines are still there. Is, and is that as we updated them? Yep. The, okay. That's how the, they were changed last year. Do those sunset? They do, and this bill repeals the sunset. They're due to sunset in July of 2021, and one of the things this draft does is to repeal that repeal. Okay. To make them permanent. 2021? Oh. Yeah. Repeals the sunset. Repeals the sunset, yes. Um, so section two changes the modification statute. Um, in a couple ways, it, we, we add, they're on line 11 and 12, we add the words rehabil rehabilitative or long-term maintenance um, to make it clear that both rehabilitative or long-term maintenance can be subject to a modification order, not, um, not just the rehabilitative maintenance. And then the last new sentence there provides that the marriage of the recipient, and here we've got different things in brackets because we've got some decisions to make. I heard, the heard some members of the committee talking about wanting to have a provision that remarriage would result in um, an end to the maintenance <coughs> award. So we've got um, the remarriage of the recipient shall result in either a downward modification or an end to the non-compensatory aspect of the maintenance award. We didn't talk about the compensatory aspect of um, long-term maintenance uh, in the committee, but currently the compensatory component of those um, permanent maintenance awards are typically not subject to downward modification um, unless the payor spouse can um, demonstrate that he or she is no longer receiving the benefit of um, the other spouses staying at home. And I can talk about compensatory maintenance. Yeah, what is the difference between yeah. compensatory maintenance and alimony? Sure, so um, some permanent, or now we're referring to it as long-term maintenance um, awards have a compensatory component, uh, and that compensatory component of the award reflects um, sort of the contract that's made during the marriage but that one- you're in, a, in a lawsuit and <coughs> I get a certain amount from the, the insurance company, mm -hmm. that's not compensatory? I stay Good. home. I stay home. Um, and I work as a nurse. I'm trying to I, okay. So what's the difference between this and you know where you win a you, you the court has determined 
that you deserve X amount of dollars. Say it's a hundred thousand dollars, and then the alimony is placed on top of that. Is that what they're doing? I think that the uh, uh, maintenance is separate. The com um, compensatory aspect is always a part of permanent maiden maintenance. Permanent maintenance isn't always doesn't always have a compensatory component, but all compensatory component components of maintenance are a part of a permanent maintenance award. Am I not? Yes, I'm totally confused. Well, it, I, can, I can talk about what it is designed to compensate. That might help. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about that. Okay. I, I think it would. I don't okay. know why we would ever interfere with what was <clears throat> awarded as an amount compensatory. Um, why would we interfere with that? That was an award that was made at a time of the of a, of a divorce, so explain why we should interfere with that. That's why I added it because um, what the what this last sentence of the bill would do is say, uh, um, upon remarriage, maintenance ends. But typically, the compensatory aspect of maintenance wouldn't end without an additional showing. Um, so that's why I put plopped this in there to make sure that the committee um, could decide whether or not it also wanted the compensatory. Just avoid getting but what is an example of a compensatory award so, come from? Yeah, so um, the court will typically state um, what par portion of a maintenance award is a compensatory portion. And because the compensatory portion is designed to compensate the recipient spouse for um, his or her contributions during the marriage. So for example, like a you know typical way that this would work is that one spouse agrees to um, stay home and take care of the household and raise the kids, mm -hmm. and the other spouse agrees to go out and into the workforce and, and um, raise or you know, earn money for the family. I see. Okay. Um, so the idea is that that spouse who stays home and works, um, they are also increasing the other spouse's future earning capacity by staying home because they are freeing up that other spouse to mm -hmm. devote time to their career and enhance their career. And that spouse will receive the benefit of that mm -hmm. long into the future. Yeah. So that award is sort of, an, the court has described a compensatory aspect of award of an award is an attempt to continue to enforce that bargain that was made during the marriage because the payor spouse is going to continue to receive the benefit of the other spouse's um, work in, um, by an increased earning capacity over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what does this do now? So, look, I would, it, I, it may be helpful to talk about how the court currently deals with compensatory. You know, I don't have time. Okay. I, uh, I think I understand how what okay. it's doing. And, um, you know, the, the choices are for the committee. Mm -hmm. So, okay. why would we, so again, I guess the question is where do we want to go with this, these, so I, I've given okay. people Two, two minutes to that are in the audience to tell us why we should do this or why we should go first. I'll go first. We got until nine o'clock. I'm going to end the hearing. At nine I can be two minutes. Just so, just so you're familiar with the process. Yeah, for the record, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge, going directly to that last issue yeah. on remarriage. Yeah. Our suggestion is. <coughs> simple and that is it should not be an automatic reduction or an automatic uh, um, modification but it could be an additional factor for the court to consider modification in other words right now the standard is a real substantial and unanticipated change of circumstances that is long-standing uh, statutory framework with substantive um, case law to support it you could add in remarriage as another basis to consider modification without making remarriage itself either an automatic termination or modification, but the court could consider it as a reason to modify. And it would make it very simple from our perspective. And I think address some of the concerns of the committee members. Okay. The other thing I would suggest that it's not in here now is that if you adopt a provision that's going to make remarriage a reconsideration, it has to be prospective only. In other words, only for cases filed after the date 
you could make it January 1st of this year or July 1st, but it can't, we cannot use that as a basis to go back and look at cases that were decided on completely other factors and considerations. So it can only be prospective. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm Martin Feldman. I was a member of the uh, Spousal Support uh, Task Force, and I also uh, represent uh, Vermont alimony reform. And I just wanted to bring up a couple of points here. Uh, first of all, it looks like on page 3, line 10, there was a typo. And uh, line 10 should say 20 plus years. I think it said zero plus years. I, have that right. Page. Well, I think you have a different bill. Different okay. Version. This is the version. That we're doing. Right. Line, just right. So page three. On the new version. On, it's in the guidelines of the new version. Oh. On the guidelines. Oh. Oh. On page uh, line what? There was a new version this morning. Yeah. Oh, a new version this morning. Okay. okay. So this would be on page three, uh, line six. The zero plus should say twenty plus. Not zero plus. Okay. So there's a typo there. All right. So um, our group uh, strongly feels that when we talk about standard of living, um, we are willing to say that it's important for all the different parties, for the families of Vermont, to include that in the statute the way it is now. But we want to also add um, a clause to that. Uh, that just simply says understanding that the standard of living of both parties will be impacted by the divorce proceedings so that there is a fairness in there to say that uh, um, that that the uh, that the court understands that standard of living is impacted by divorce and that should be in the statute somewhere so that's considered um, the other thing that's important to us uh, is um, the subject of remarriage of the recipient, uh, Vermont, is right now the only state in our region and one of only two or three states in the country that doesn't terminate automatically remarriage upon, upon uh, divorce. And um, uh, that doesn't terminate alimony upon remarriage. And um, uh, all, the, all the states around us, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, have done this. Uh, the reason they've done this um, is because it's fair. Uh, the federal government, in terms of dealing with um, Social Security, terminates uh, it, it, if there's remarriage. It's the same thing. So I think Vermont should be doing that too. And also, very importantly, we talk about these terms compensatory, we talk about rehabilitative, and we talk about long term. I think, and our group thinks, that these need to be defined in the statute. That, uh, that the, um, the law needs to state what these terms mean. And if the law doesn't state what these terms mean and they're wrapped up in case law, it just adds to litigation and legal fees and disagreements in the future. Thank you. So that's it. Okay. okay. Can I just ask, is that the New Hampshire law that, that you stated about the taking into consideration the standard of living that might change? Is that in the New Hampshire law? Uh, the New Hampshire law doesn't even have standard of living in it. Oh, okay. right, right. I'm, we're just saying that uh, that that's something that we think is important to include that clause to help define it. Okay. Thank you. I'm Carrie Brown, the executive director. Sorry of the, to be so pushy. <laughs> it's okay. Executive Director of Vermont Commission on Women. Um, I have a document that I'm referring to that I have sent yeah. to the committee, yep. so you can read the whole thing. But yeah. um, just a couple of points. I want to talk about the um, addition of the standard of living at the time of marriage uh, does seem to be a move in the direction of more greater equity, so we appreciate that. We have a suggestion that I shared with the committee mm -hmm. for possibly slightly clearer wording that really makes it absolutely clear this is applying to both parties which is um, one of our primary interests. Um, the subject of compensatory maintenance comes up in a couple of different ways in here, um, but it's, it's already, there is already a standard by which compensatory maintenance can be modified. And the, the, uh, the obliger spouse has to show that they no longer are able to reap the benefits of the bargain that was made during the marriage. And so if somebody 
you know, becomes paralyzed and can't practice their profession that the bargain of the marriage helps them prepare for, that sort of thing. So there is already a safeguard in there. And so it's, a, it's important to, um, whatever changes you make, make sure that they're not sweeping up compensatory maintenance into the, the modification process that already exists for other kinds of maintenance. So you don't want to lower that standard or change it because it's a very particular kind of payment and it, deserve, it needs to be treated in a different way. So just be uh, ask you to be careful about that. And then the, the section about terminating upon retirement of the, the payee, um, a couple of- That's not in here anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, um, remarriage. Oh, remarriage. Oh, remarriage, right, right, that's right. Yeah. You took the retirement. The remarriage of the payee. So, this is something that's also already addressed in, in the law, that uh, remarrying can be a real substantial and unanticipated change in circumstances. Um, it, can, you, it can be grounds for downward modification already. And additionally, within case law, there's also consideration of the payor remarrying and the impact that has on their ability to pay, and that can be considered as a real substantial and unanticipated change in circumstances as well. And so the current law, that, as the courts have interpreted it, ha treats both parties equitably. It looks at the remarriage of the payor, the remarriage of the payee, and it doesn't automatically make a decision because there's so many variations in what can happen, so many situations where a remarriage may or may not impact somebody's financial situation in different ways. So we have people who don't commingle their finances, people who well, where one spouse works and one doesn't. Um, there's just a range of possibilities that the court has already recognized and has been able to take into consideration. So I don't think this is necessary. Yeah. Just wondering how you felt about the judge's suggestion that instead of it being an automatic downgrade or end, that it be added as a factor to real and substantial changes. Um, I think it already is. I'm not an attorney, so um, I would defer to the judge on that. But I, I, it has been used already to demonstrate that the real change in circumstances. So. I'm not convinced that it's necessary, but I would certainly feel a lot better about that than about just having an automatic action. Mm -hmm. Additionally, this only addresses the remarriage of the recipient spouse, and it doesn't re address the remarriage of the paying spouse, which is completely inequitable. And I don't know why we would want to build in that level of inequity to a law. So to make a change that increases the inequity uh, seems concerning to me. Well, the, the judge's suggestion, I think, would Applicable. Yes, yes, yes okay. absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Go. Please. <laughs> thank you. And I have less than two minutes. Good. Um, uh, Terry, <laughs> Terry Corson's with the Vermont Bar Association. I did send out the newest version to the right. VBA Connect community. and. Penny Benelli, who's testified here before, is the chair of that section. She wasn't able to be here, or she'd planned to send in written comments, but it's my understanding she hasn't yet, and I wasn't able to reach her this morning. But um, the consensus is that the, uh, the family law section much prefers this more recent version than the previous one. Uh, they consider it fair to look at the standard of living, and if it's not possible to maintain the same standard of living, it's fair for the parties to share share fairly in the benefits and burdens of the new arrangement, which I think this covers. Um, since Judge Gerson's comments came last evening, I have not had a chance to hear back from one, but my a strong assumption is that they would very much agree with Judge Gerson's um, comments regarding the remarriage and Ms. Brown's comments regarding the remarriage uh, factor. Um, and they would um, uniformly appreciate the opportunity to testify. I know that time was very limited here, but if it passes over to the House, then they would anticipate the opportunity in the House Judiciary. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I, I, see no, I, I think the suggestion on line nine of page two to add the term both his or her reasonable needs at the standard of living established during civil marriage? I don't think you need to because it's already on line six. Well, it could make somebody feel better. Well, it, it was very different language. There wasn't this at all and added by. Right. Um, so where are we here? Line the, the ten? Line nine. Line nine. Yeah. At yeah. the end of the, of, after the word meet, 
Yeah. The suggestion was to add from the Commission on Women was to add the word both. No. Well, I, she had a whole, I, yeah, I had it's a whole paragraph like of it. I can read it to you if you like. I, I think that it, it addresses the, the payer on line six, and it, I mean the payee, the person that's getting it on line six and the person who's paying it on line ten. I mean, they're both in there. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yes. Right. Line. I'm line sure six. <coughs> line six says, establish Peggy. the standard of living established uh, during the civil marriage. Could you print out for the what Carrie sent? Because I didn't. I know. It was pages long. I did send it to you. Yeah. <coughs> um, yesterday. Afternoon. I'll forward it to you. I can read it. Okay. okay. It's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so the I just whole, forward it to you, Peggy. That whole subsection would read, the ability of the spouse from whom maintenance is sought to meet both his or her reasonable needs and those of the spouse seeking maintenance at the standard of living established during the marriage. <coughs> That's pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. I still think it was addressed on line six, but okay. I'm fine. Well, I think that's add right. that. Okay. The next issue is what we do at the bottom of the page. Obviously, the technical amendment on line six of page yeah. three yeah. should be 20 years. Thank you for catching that. Um, thank you for repealing the, uh, for repealing the repeal of whatever you want to call that on page four. I think everybody agrees with that. So then we come down to what do we do on lines 13 to 15. Um, and uh, Judge Grierson, I, I kind of agree with him that that's an easy fix. The problem I have is can't be just perspective. It sounds totally unfair to people that have, I mean, it's sort of like okay, from now on, everybody's going to be in one world, and all the you poor suckers that were there beforehand don't get the chance. And I realize it might create a problem for the court. But so for the poor suckers, so to speak, that you mentioned, that, can't they still go via the other route of significant Exactly. But if marriage isn't considered, in yeah, it still has all those possibilities. I just think it's kind of unfair there. to yeah. people that it's sort of like if we were offering good time to offenders, and you're already in jail, and should you get it along with everybody else, or should you be just the new people? Well, what are we doing with life without parole? It's not retroactive. That's what I'm That's saying. What I mean. We made good time retroactive. But, but the fairness thing, I, I take the judge's point about. So I was making a point, you made a point. Yes. There's one for each of us. Okay. And yours is bigger because you're the chair. But <laughs> just to clarify, what, what I would say is the, the judge from the beginning of this discussion was <coughs> focused on finality and making sure that we don't upset all of the um, established orders that are out there. and. I would hate to have one word being added uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time produce that kind of um, change. So if, if this is prospective and we take the judge's suggestion, I can vote for it. I agree with your point. With all due respect to the judge, there still has to be a demonstration that a remarriage is going to rise to the level of a real substantial unanticipated change in circumstances. There has to be a case made. And at this point, uh, to deny all those people who have been suffering and coming to us originally for why this problem has been dealt with um, just doesn't seem fair to me at all. I understand it may be inconvenient to the court. There's possibly some cases that will have to be looked at, but there still has to be that balancing act does it rise to the level of a real substantial and unanticipated change in circumstances? But and, I think and, having that word remarriage is one of the criteria should be very clear. And, and I can, if I can just say one little thing about your comment about finality. There, my understanding is there really never is any finality. Is that there are changes made. That. Five seconds. Five seconds. All right. Is there general agreement if Brent were to draft this? at least three members of the committee to vote on Judge Grierson's ex the changes we've already talked to. Judge Grierson's accept, uh, 
proposal except allowing it to be not just prospective. We'll look at the language, Rim can type it up, we'll look at the language if we get a chance. Are you, how is, what's your availability? I'm here for the rest of the morning. You're here for the rest of the morning? I think so. I, we're, in, we're doing pleasant next. Well, actually, uh, we're doing 303. 303 is first, and then oh, okay. we'll Well, maybe we could hold up expungement for five minutes at, at 9.30 and come back to this. Would that give you enough time yes. to redraft? Yes. So is, is that a general consensus? You mean that? No, well, the we would, should look at the draft before we yes. do, do that. With that concept. Do you mean is it a consensus to proceed that way or to vote yes on to proceed, to proceed that way, to look at the draft at hopefully 9.30, and you know, then go from there. But at least that we have something to look at. So we're taking suggestions from all sides, but the only change from Judge Grierson's suggestion is to make it, is not to have a perspective on to allow people to, you know. Senator Draft is gonna say, it's a factor. It's only a factor. It is not a determining right. thing. It's a factor to be considered. If it opens a floodgate, it opens a floodgate. I mean, one brief comment. Brief comment, Judge, you're already passed. I know. It is not a matter of inconvenience to the court. Understand that the, the award of alimony that may be opened up by not making it perspective only may create an imbalance of, of the entire s settlement or decision by the court because they were making assessment of division of property, physical assets, in addition to alimony under certain criteria that exist at the time. All these folks have had an opportunity to have their decisions reviewed and appealed. Know. I know. Works. That's why I want to keep we it. We get a bill out of here. It goes to the floor. People can amend it. When it gets to the floor, if they amend it, they amend it. When you know you're certainly welcome. Obviously, when you get to the other body, and if they t if they take it up, which is a huge if, then everything is reopened and starts all over again. And I understand. I just wanted the committee to understand. No, for me, it's not an inconvenience to the committee. To me, the most important thing about passing this bill right now is to make sure the guidelines stay in effect. I absolutely that we not sunset the guidelines. Um, so the other parts are. Would be helpful, but quite frankly, I like the um, it's prospective, but we'll see. Okay. What happens. But I want to ask another question. Uh, you can do that at 9 30. Oh, we're going to do it's it not at related to this thing, it's related to where is the statement in here that the re that the remarriage you're going to ask it, the question anyway. Now. Yeah, I am. It isn't in here because that isn't in here now. She's going to add it to a different part. It, oh, you're going to yeah, add that. It's going to be in that section, yeah. the same section. The the, and the compensatory yeah. is going to be addressing that differently. It's, that's going away. That whole last sentence is going to go away. And instead, there's going to be a sentence that says the remarriage of either shots may be considered as a factor. Can we just look at, the, please, yeah. if, can we just look at the redraft so I can take up 203? Okay. And if you want to fill okay. that bill, okay. fill okay. that bill before we can pass it and amend it. What's 203? 303 is the one that only had okay. one vote. And whose vote was that? That's the chair. Oh, listen, Senator Sears, the same thing happened to me yesterday in committee. Four and people voted against trading. me, yeah. and I said they <laughs> should beware because there might be an amendment on the floor. Yeah. No. They, they would pay for it. What that's what I told them. Huh? Huh? What? I don't get the draft. Thank you all. We'll be back at 930. To put your bill back in the Okay. Did you, um, is Eric here or? Oh, yeah. David Mickenberg. Yeah. How are you? Mickenberg. Mickenberg. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Whatever, yeah. whatever you want. Whatever you want. Only known you for ten years. My baseball coach called, called me Michael Berry because that's how he read my name. Yeah. Yeah. Michael Michael Berry. Berry. Yeah. I signed up for the team. Yeah. So you have a shirt with Michael Berry on the back. Yeah. Exactly. Let me know. I'm about tonight. Yeah. She's been insane. Thank you. Strike all amendments. Strike all amendments. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a, there's a, a big conference. Well, there's one vote. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, you really do have to compromise. I think when we went over this bill, the one place we saw where Vermont was way out of line was on the, on what it, maybe you could speak to that, or do you have, do you have a witness? Do you have a witness? It's just me. I, I don't, I'm happy to say. What did you do? Sure. I don't know where. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry. No problem. I know where he is, though. Uh, David, Mick yeah. David Mickenberg here on behalf of the Vermont Association for Mickenberg. Mickenberg. Yeah, that's my yeah. Um, uh, so I think the idea. I mean, we. You know, I know that you heard from Chris Malley and Art Wolf in terms of what inflation, particularly medical inflation, has been. And it makes sense that these auto, um, auto minimums have not been adjusted since 1998 when the legislature acted on this and have not kept up with inflationary pressures. And the real impact on uh, folks is those that are, are injured and there's insufficient uh, coverage for them. Um, when we dealt with this issue, now I wasn't here, but my understanding when we dealt with this issue in 1998 and uh, subsequently uh, an area where, and I know that there's been some concern about the impact of, of the original proposal, which is the doubling of the limits, both the, the primary and the underinsured, but one area of potential compromise, and we'd be, we obviously would support the bill as introduced and would encourage you to support that. But if you wanted to take some action, if there wasn't sufficient votes on this committee, one idea would be um, to double the uh, underinsured piece. And my understanding, I don't want to speak for the industry, but that's far less impactful in terms of rates. And I just want to say something about rates. Every time we want to do anything related to protecting Vermonters, we hear from the industry that, well, the rates are going to go up, the rates are going to go up. We never hear, um, you know, there's this sort of sacrosanct idea that, like, well, we can't touch profits. We can't touch the profits of Liberty Mutual or State Farm or any of these other multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations. We always have to pass it along to the consumer. And I just don't buy that as, a, as an argument. So, By the way, I just got to my car insurance company today that, or yesterday that now I'm going to be restricted to a six-month insurance policy rather than a year policy, oh, really? which is obviously the maybe I'm a risk now. I don't know because it's doggy daycare. Doggy daycare. Yeah. Doggy daycare. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's doggy daycare or what, but I, I'd like an amendment to this that requires them. If you've been at a year policy, you shouldn't be able to be pushed into a six month policy. That's no. BS. The insurance industry really needs to wait. You know, Eisenhower called it the military industrial something complex. I think it's the insurance pharmaceutical complex yeah, well, that rules us now. I'll certainly be looking for another insurer, but I, I, I think well, that's if six months. had a, you know, a contract with an insurance agency for a year policy and all of a sudden you're a six month, that's like you're a high risk. Because mm -hmm. you had an accident. I didn't well, have an accident. I took my wife off the insurance. She can't even drive. So they, sh they shouldn't, yeah. they should be looking at my record, not hers. Absolutely. I mean, it's that's not the, that, that, I know that's a sidelight <laughs> to do with the bill, but that seems like common sense consumer protection. Yeah. Complain about the insurance industry. <laughs> I mean, the the the. So the, we get a bill to the floor. <laughs> the idea about premiums going up sort of rings hollow for me. My understanding is that Maine has double our limits yeah. and a lower premium. So well, it's you know, and to add insult to injury, they're still allowing my house and my. Um, umbrella policy to remain as a year policy. Right. To my auto. Mm -hmm. So, as in. The same thing for me. They did it to you too? Yeah. But in the spirit of compromise, I think we would be, I mean, we would be, given that we, it's been 1998, since 1998, that we did anything related to these limits, um, even having mm -hmm. something on the underinsured um, uh, would be helpful, I think. So. Jamie, do you want to? Yeah, I guess if we could, Mr. Chairman. Jamie Fino with Perma Paper on behalf of the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Um, I'm not sure what I would uh, comment on. I can uh, remind the committee about the concerns with the original bill. Um, 
I'm not aware, I wasn't aware until I just heard it now about uh, doubling the, the uninsured motorist provision. So I, I don't know what sort of impact that might have uh, on, um, on policies, on rates, on the public. Um, as you know, Vermont requires individuals to maintain automobile insurance. Our position from the beginning was that um, the data shows that the injury claims uh, do not rise above Vermont's minimum limits, so there doesn't seem to be a uh, public policy reason to increase those limits when we're requiring folks to maintain automobile insurance. Uh, you also heard from not only me, but the Department of Financial Regulation on a survey they had done that shows that uh, approximately 10% or so of Vermonters are at the minimum limits. So they're trying hard to maintain automobile insurance. Um, raising it without a specific sort of public policy need doesn't make sense to APCIA to require folks to have more when they don't need it. And it's our assumption that those at the minimum limits are most least able to afford such an increase. So, and that increase was, was sizable, anywhere from 10, and I think the department uh, had some information that showed much higher uh, numbers, 10% uh, on the policy. So, not sure what the uninsured motorist uh, rationale is. I would have to refresh my memory, but I believe when it was last adjusted um, that the uninsured motorist policy limits track um, with your uh, BI limits at a certain point. So if you're at 100, 300, your underinsured, your UM, UIM limits also track with that. But I, subject to confirmation, I can uh, you know, verify that. But I, I guess my point is that those already go up as your policy limits go up. So I'm not sure, again, what the purpose or rationale would be to uh, increase the UIM limits at this point. What, did, what was that last thing you said about they, the, 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 I'd have to look, but the UI, uninsured motors and underinsured motors limits track policies as they have higher limits. So um, 5,100, 100, 300, the, the UIM will match okay. those BI limits as you go up. So that provides more coverage more potential avenue of recourse, obviously, for injured parties. Um, but uh, they don't, you know, they're at the minimum now for those at the very minimum. Okay. And so the, the proposal here, as I understand it, is to require a higher minimum for the uninsured. That's what I heard. Okay. I don't, did you hear, yeah, double the UIM? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Again, not sure if the, the impact of that or what the policy reason to do so would be. Anybody else have comments on this problem or anybody else? The proposal is to raise the double the 20 to the 10 to 20. On what? Uninsured. Uninsured. Un uninsured. And if you look at the how to other <coughs> limits compare in other states, um, New Hampshire's at 25, uh, Maine's at 25. Is that in the original bill, the uninsured? <coughs> well, it was part of it. Part of it. I'm just trying to find where we're in the... It was increasing it all the limits. Section 3. Section 3 is the UM, UIM yes. limits. So that would... Well, it's not my... They do a strike ball. That says uh, 50,000... That's... This... Draft uh, as introduced, section three does double those numbers, but they seem higher than what people are saying. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. So what does that do to premium? Well, how would you ever know? Well, no, but I don't know. They would, oh. this thing? Nobody would ever know. Oh. Yes. It Insurance companies um, may increase your premiums for any thousand. reason they want to. So the they may increase damage. it because of this, or they may increase it because of an accident, um, or they may increase it because I, they yeah, have I'm not sure. hair across their nose. Uh, no, like, no, no, right no, now, no, for no, uninsured no, and underinsured, no, it's a similar no, threshold for property damage. Of Ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars, which is the same as liability. Ten thousand for both. Okay. The property I think what you heard from David Nickenberg was um, not property damage, but bodily injury. So his proposal was related to uninsured, underinsured, bodily injury increasing. Um, I think doubling. 
So if you look at section three, again, this is not, doesn't deal with property damage. You actually don't see the property damage in this subsection C, which starts on line 19. But the proposal is to increase from 50,000 to 100,000. So these are higher generally than the liability um, policies. Uh, for one person injured, and then increasing from doubling from 100 to 200,000 for two or more persons killed or injured. Oh, so just the the end result would be just we strike everything except section three. That I believe that yeah, is the proposal. Four, yes. And then I think what Jamie Fian was talking about, you can see if you read on in that section, if the limits of liability coverage in the policy are greater than what is required, um, then your uninsured, uninsured would, would track that, right? So if you decided to go more than the statutory minimum, your uninsured, uninsured would track that. Um, with the one exception, it says if you continue reading on line three, so your uninsured, uninsured goes up, um, shall be the same unless the policyholder otherwise directs. So there is some flexibility is that so so that means the, the limits of the uninsured motors shall be the same so under current law you are required to have liability in the amount of 25,000 uh, per person or 50,000 for all mm -hmm. persons in one accident um, but some people have more, yes, right? right? Mm -hmm. So if you had more for your liability coverage, your uninsured and underinsured coverage would also track that and go up um, if it was a, you know, above the statutory minimums for uninsured yeah. and uninsured, okay. unless you directed otherwise. Which is the current way it works. That's the current way it works. Yeah. And that is not being proposed to change. Right. Um, so it's all it's going to yeah. depend on the individual policy holder if they have greater coverage. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. So I think you're right, Senator Sears, that if, you know, I think the current proposal is basically to enact Section 3. Yeah. And, and 4, obviously. And, and 4 for the effective date. And this does not, again, uh, touch the, the property damage, which is remains $10,000. So, so right now, and this I must, they have a note here from something. Right now, Vermont uninsured motorist rating is 6.8 percent, 47th lowest in the country. <coughs> it's actually a very small portion of your auto insurance. Mm -hmm. Is the uninsured from this policy? As I looked at mine, I've forgotten out somewhere. $800 if I was doing a year. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I figure it out now that it's going to be six months unless that change insurance companies. So you can hit, but that is a very small portion of the, of the charge. Mm -hmm. So the proposal is to just do section three, the uninsured, mm -hmm. nothing else. Right. <clears throat> And with 50,000 people driving with a suspended license, yeah. your chances of getting hit by somebody your vehicle might be <coughs> higher than in other places. While we're trying to deal with that. Well, it might take it away or it might not because I don't know. I, insurance that's a question companies, I'd like to know the answer to. I'm I don't think you'll that. ever hear the answer because insurance companies can do just anything they please. Well, the Department of Financial Regulation does might. regulate the insurance. They do regulate it, but they so can I, increase I mean, your rates. I, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. It's just that 
to say they can do anything. They well, want. yes. Sir. I'm a little testy today. I understand that. <laughs> We've got to I got rolled by my committee yesterday, and today I'm having a Anyway. But you've got your happy outfit. Oh, yes. <laughs> I put it David, do you have any figures nationally as to what portion of your auto insurance bill the uninsured motorists generally is? I don't have exact in numbers. In terms of percentage of them. Yeah, I don't have the exact number. Um, I can try to find that. But I know that the last time we looked at this, and, and the reason that they're different now, is that the underinsured piece, the UIM limits that are in there, the imp I remember that the conversation that we had, the impact was far less than, um, than just the, well, under, the underlying minimums. Is there a third vote? Um, I just want to say one thing here. Gaffney says we should do a study before we do this. I'm just surprised. What? Gaffney. I this. Yeah. From the department says we should do a study before we do this. There's not a third vote. I don't want to go forward. I mean, there's no point in wasting the time. I didn't mean to dump on insurance companies. No, I, I mean, I did mean to dump on insurance companies. <laughs> 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 but not on you. Notice I'm still here. <laughs> and remember, Senator, just, just the, this, the UIM, that's your own insurance making up the difference for the lack of insurance. Uh, so somebody only has 25,000 insurance, that's going to be your own insurance or kicking in. Or they don't have it at all, your own insurance kicking in. <coughs> which is which are, likely in, in, in 50,000 Vermonters have their licenses suspended. Those 50,000 are unlikely, most of them are unlikely to have insurance. And, and if they're driving and you, or, or others who might be likely to be underinsured. But again, I look at the policies. That would be what I would like if we get a third vote. If we don't get a third vote, then it's no. Jamie? At the risk of stepping into it further, Mr. Chairman, just to remind the committee, you know, this would double the, the required minimum. So this isn't sort of any sort of flexibility or leeway that the company would have. This doubles that portion. Regardless of what the portion or percentage of the overall premium is, it will cover that portion of the premium. And again, we have not heard the, the public policy reason to do this. I thought when I had the quote unquote compromise described to me, I, I thought it was not taking out sections and leaving one section at the original numbers, but that the numbers had been, the midpoint had been reached on the numbers. In the, in the spirit of compromise, I would suggest that we do a, re if you don't mind, doing a redraft of this bill and come back tomorrow morning at, what time do we have open tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yeah. Um, is this Wednesday? This is Thursday. We have 10.15 to 11.30. Would you come back here between 10.15 and 10, at 10.15 tomorrow? <laughs> and we just schedule this from 10.15 to 10.30 tomorrow? Please, and we just make a decision based upon our redraft. So at least we're looking at what the proposal is. Just In the section, meantime, just section three. Yeah, just section three. If we strike all of just yeah. section three and four, actually four, because that's the effective date. So just just those sections. And in the meantime, if Jamie wants to find out what this might cost the average Vermonter, and if David wants to find out. Three votes, it passes out of the committee. If it has two votes, it doesn't. I'm not going to ask to vote it up negatively. Um, so we'll just decide whether we've got three votes or not. Obviously, right now, two of us are okay with this, three of us are undecided, or have already decided no. So, is that a fair assessment? No. Still undecided. undecided. Still undecided. Okay. Yeah, undecided. Three undecided, three two undecided. decided. <laughs> so, so, I can. Right, so, good morning, committee. Bryn here from morning, Legislative morning. Council here with draft 2.1 of S99. Um, this is a clean draft for you to vote on, so there's no highlight here. But if you look at page two, um, subdivision six, 
that uh, we've now taken the suggestion from the Commission on Women um, to make it clear that that standard of living applies to both spouses, um, that the court has to consider the standard of living for both spouses. It doesn't. It says both his or her reasonable needs and those of the spouse seeking maintenance at the standard of living. It doesn't address the standard of living for the person who's paying. I think that it- No, from whom maintenance saw and- But that's both his or her reasonable needs and those of the spouse seeking, seeking maintenance, maintenance at the standard of living. Yes, yeah, so, so it's both it, of them. No. Oh, that's how I read it. Okay. So, so the, the first spouse is the one from whom maintenance is sought. Yeah. And the second one is the spouse seeking maintenance. So, uh, just let me understand this then. The way I read this is it says that they, <coughs> the ability of the spouse from whom maintenance is sought to meet both both his or her reasonable needs and those of the spouse seeking maintenance at the standard of living the from whom maintenance is okay i i don't i see this time. it doesn't make sense <coughs> yeah, but if uh, that is this is the suggestion to carry payor payor's reasonable needs and the payees yes at the time of the living I want to make sh make it very clear that the the standard of living of the payor is also taken into consideration. That was my main concern, and I don't think this does it because it says both his or her reasonable needs and the person seeking the maintenance at their standard of living. It doesn't say anything about the standard of living. <coughs> <coughs> Am I wrong about that? But what would happen if you said at the standard of living established by both during the civil marriage with that that, that would be better. I liked okay. the Briggs original one better the first time because I don't think this does it. I, I don't, it clearly says <coughs> the standard of living for the person seeking maintenance. It doesn't say anything about the standard of living for the person paying, which was the whole point of the whole thing. Are you here for response? Um, it brings you, but, I, but she said you guys are pulling in the marijuana expungement, so I thought I'd just stop in and make sure you guys don't Oh, okay, thank you. Am I wrong about that? I, mean, I, I see I see what you're saying. I do I do see how um, you could read it either way. Um, so I'm just thinking about how to rephrase okay. that. So, All right. Okay. Um, All right. Well, I, I if people are okay with the concept, yeah. If people are okay with the concept, I okay. expect Sorry. you to put together a final draft that we can yeah. Okay. Before it goes up the floor. Okay. That, that words it more clearly. Yep. Okay. I can do that. I think I think some rearranging of the words will make it. Okay. We'll make it. So then the next change is on page, <clears throat> so uh, page three, three, bottom of the page. That's a new sentence that the court may consider the remarriage of either party as a factor in whether there has been a showing of a real, substantial, and unanticipated change of circumstances. Yep. And am I I'm hearkening back to Carrie's testimony? Is that um, currently the case? So yes. this says that they may consider it. Can they consider they it? They can now? consider it now. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't okay. really change it. I, I think it changes the statute, but it codifies what is happening mm -hmm. in practice. Okay. To make it, because I think that was part of the discussion was that it needs to be clearer in statute what the court will consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You also put the two in front of the zero. I did, and, and my apologies for the typo. This has not seen the benefit of our editors, so it will before you, <laughs> before well, it goes to the matter. floor. <laughs> they yes. You and the sign on the door. Um, yes, they matter. They do matter. So, so it's no longer the case then, now, just for me to be clear, is that a remarriage doesn't cut you off. It's, but I thought there could have been a separate statement with regard to the compensatory piece. You know, that's I thought that the, such a good I thought idea. that the committee wanted to um, leave the compensatory piece alone. May, um, yes, I mean, I I want that to be. So that would remain exist how it oh, how okay. deals it currently. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, it's an fine. existing case yep. law. Okay, yep. Okay, I mean, this is pretty light here. Instead of saying 
consider it. You know, we've, but we really want it. I thought, Jeanette, you really. Yeah, I'd rather say have it be stronger and I would too. maybe say shall consider. Yeah. Or, um, I mean, I would like it to say that it ends, but I realize that that's not going to. I could go, go for that. If you say shall consider and it's retrospective, then I really <coughs> do think you're looking for additional. Oh, but I'm, I'm not saying right up. Does this have, well, but this goes back. It's not Judge prospective. Um, uh, if you caution. wanted it to be only prospective, you would have to specify that in the effective date. Yeah. Oh. oh, Christ, I don't want that being retroactive. Oh, I do want this being retroactive. No, I know that, but on this issue? Yeah, people should be able to bring it up because some judges take it into account and some don't. And Well, how about, so somebody's got a, had a divorce 20 years ago, and now is the judge got to look back at those 20 intervening years between then and now, if you're going retroactively, in terms of if they remarry, in terms of the may consider the remarriage. Yes. Well, I think I, if somebody, I, if somebody, I'd rather this thing just went forward. I I, I, I can also look forward really. if it goes forward, but if it's retrospective, I can't. You can't. I can't. You cannot vote for it. I, I just think that... You know, why don't we get something that we can all vote on and get it through? Because it doesn't do anything. Well, certainly. Uh, I, I mean, it doesn't... If we if we said it ends in marriage... You're completely ignoring all the people that came in here to complain about right. what's going on in their lives. <clears throat> but the fact that people come in and complain doesn't mean that we're obligated to... No. ...retro actively change their There's settlement. There's a ton of things to complain about. Okay. That's the reason they all came here. As a, well, so we're fixing the future. Like constituents, what they're asking for something to change. I think I have a responsibility to vote that way. I'm just explaining where I am. I mean, I, if somebody is happy they got remarried and they're not going to file it, if it's retroactive, they still have to file um, a court, uh, whatever you file, mm -hmm. to have it reconsidered. So some people may and some people may not. Some people may say, it's not worth it, I'm not going to do it. And some people may say, you know, my spouse got remarried and is now making a fortune and I live in a, an 8 by 8 cabin. And we did hear that from, actually we heard that particular story from a woman who's there's was plenty of stories, that's for sure. Spouse, her spouse, and mean if we put six. She lost, but anyway, so I think no, it needs to be retroactive. It's retroactive. Or because it's retrospective, it should only be May. Okay, I, How about the future? May if, if How about, we, the, how about um, the poor make it retroactive? Future. Say that again. I said I'm happy to leave it at May. If, if, if it's retroactive, it because the then, yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, it, instead of saying shall, because may, I guess we don't ever say I just shall. Like, I just like, <clears throat> hey, you get married, you're out, except for the compensatory piece. That's how I would do it. No, let's go forward. Just if you get remarried, it ends. It except ends, for, except for the compensatory piece. Well, I would go with that, but if no one else would. Uh, to do that. Okay. All right. Well, wait a minute. Participate in this did conversation. You hear, did you hear what yeah. her proposal? Yeah. It ends at, except for the compensatory piece mm -hmm. on remarriage. I can't vote for that. Right. Except even with except for the compensatory piece, which well, will continue. Well, I don't like the end piece, uh, the automatic ending, and and the. Retrospective piece, so that's that would be further away from what I would vote. I mean, again, I, the committee should work its will, but that's just what I. So, when the next draft will provide that um, maintenance ends upon remarriage, except for the compensatory aspect of a maintenance award. I'm fine. And would you like that to be prospective only, or? No. Yeah. I would, but. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> don't know that you want to use this on the field. Make that perspective. 
that again ignores all the people that have a right. problem that brought this up to begin with. Why would that lose it on the floor any more than making it prospective? Yes, we are. All right. I, all right. Let's propose something else here. No, 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 no. That's good. Go ahead. <laughs> Do it. Pro prospective only? Or? No. 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 We'll take a vote and finish this bill. Okay. Tomorrow at 10 um, This we'll draft. I'll read on page one. 2.1. Um, yes. The first change, all of the changes are in yellow highlight. Okay. I put brackets around the things that the committee still needs to make a decision about. So if we start on page 10, that's the first um, yellow highlight. So this is, this is, oh, sorry. Yeah. Great. So this is qualifying predicate misdemeanors um, and possession of controlled substances offenses. So this would um, make the, that five-year waiting period apply, as the, the committee decided yesterday. And then throughout, we've changed that successfully completed the terms and conditions of the sentence for the conviction to satisfy the judgment. Um, bottom of the page, we put restitution ordered by the court um, paid in full back in. Mm -hmm. That had been struck by, that was the proposal was to strike it in the last version you saw. Um, so if you turn to page 11, this is the procedure for um, the court uh, sealing rather than expunging these types of convictions. So we've left in that, um, that proposal by legal aid that the court can seal instead of expunge if sealing better serves the interests of justice and the petitioner owes restitution at the time of the filing of the petition to expunge. Um, I, I'm not mm, sure okay. if I thought that the committee expressed agreement in that yesterday, um, but I'm not sure. No. Okay. No, I don't think we expressed agreement. Uh, we have not come to an agreement on the issue of whether owing restitution is <coughs> you can still have your record sealed or expunged. Okay. I think that's one of the big divides. I think we agreed on the years and five. And we agreed to change the word to satisfy the judgment everywhere, everywhere in the bill. Thanks to Judge Grierson. I think it's still restitution where there's a great divide here in the committee. Okay. Or maybe a little divide, but. <clears throat> okay. So we'll move on. <clears throat> to bottom of page 11, these are qualifying predicate misdemeanors. So we've um, returned to five years. The waiting period is five years from mm -hmm. the, satis the satisfaction of the judgment. That's what, we That's what yeah. you agreed to yesterday. Anywhere you did not have an agreement, I put brackets. So if you turn to page 12. Yeah, I would bracket the, in the next version, bracket the, anything doing, that had to do with restitution. All of it, all restitution. Yeah. Well, I thought you. I wasn't. Um, I wasn't on board with that. Other members of the committee were. I think the chair directed that Bryn put it in on the strength of what seemed to be a four-to-one. Um, so, I'm I'm going to vote for the bill anyway if restitution is in there. I just think it replicates the problem we saw with surcharges. Okay, so. the, to, to leave the restitution has to be paid. That's, yeah. 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 And I, I, I agree with you that yeah. I would rather have it not be That's there. That's why I meant that I, but, I, okay, is there a general but, agreement amongst at least three of us to, to make restitution be required? I agree, make restitution I, be required. In favor of restitution. I'm okay. And I'll vote for it, but I would you, hope okay. that maybe in the Leave house the restitution as it is now. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's right along. Good deal. That's what I did with that. Okay. We all agree on satisfying the judgment. Yes. Okay, so bottom of page 12, we're still in the qualifying predicate misdemeanor section. Mm -hmm. So this is the provision that says a criminal history record can be sealed, or that is sealed, <coughs> is eligible for expungement. Um, the original proposal said five years after the date that this, the, the sealing order is issued if the person doesn't commit any subsequent offense. Legal aid proposed six years rather than five years. So that's a decision point for the committee. Five, six, eight, nine, and yeah. 
five out of the Why did they want six? Yeah. I'm not sure they answered that yesterday. Bless you. But I'm leaving it at five. I think that their proposal was to change it to um, six throughout. There's, for example, um, for because in other portions of the statute, it's a 10 year waiting period and they've dropped it to six. Um, so I believe that they wanted consistency. Oh, does this replace 10? No, this replaces five, but um, for example, the next portion of the statute is qualifying felony property offenses and the waiting period there for expungement is after sealing is 10 years in the original proposal and they propose dropping it to six. So I'm making a conjecture that the reason they're proposing six here is for consistency. Makes sense. All right, so what are we going with? If that's what they propose. should leave it at five. I, okay. I just think in this we have five for everything. Okay. 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 I, so, I have a question on 13 where it says two years after the day. Um, yeah, so this is the, on page 13, all of this bracketed yellow or gray is um, also the legal aid proposal yeah. to add additional time frames um, that would apply depending on what type of subsequent offense the petitioner committed. So, oh, too yeah, complicated. Too complicated. Drop it. Right. You read it? Yeah. Strikes okay. Right. Um, all that highlight. Except for um, sub three, three there sub is three. different. Yeah. Um, that is the option for a hearingless grant of the petition if the respondent stipulates. Okay. If the respondent so, stipulates. Oh, okay. I don't have any problem with that. Okay. That's Dave. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so next substantive decision-making point that you need to look at is on page 15. So now we're in qualifying felony property offenses and selling, dispensing, or transporting um, regulated substances. So the proposal from legal aid was to drop the waiting period from 10 to five years for uh, sealing, for a petition to seal. I'm okay with five. I'm not. I'm right that back in the box. I'm not okay with five. I think a lot of these people would just right, be right back in the business. <laughs> Ten years is a long time. Five years is a long time. Five years. So it was an hour for some people. So. No. It's after they've satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. It's after. <clears throat> and what do we do for misdemeanors? Five, I believe. Well, let's look. I think you treat different types of misdemeanors differently. I haven't memorized yeah. these yet. Five years for five years. So I think it should be ten. Now, if we do five for misdemeanor drug, probably I'll be ten. This is or not, eight, something yeah, like that. Yeah, this is not it just drugs. Least, huh? It's not just drugs. I know, but I'm trying to. But it is uh, includes drugs. Yes, right? yes. I agree. So I think it should be. I would say eight would be reasonable because the the evidence is that after seven years, you're no more likely to commit a crime than the average person. So. So how long does it take right. to complete to satisfy a judgment? It could take well, two it years. Could take three years. Two, whatever it takes. Is, so. It depends on the sentence, obviously, right. but also depends on the individual. But I think eight years is, is probably, if, if seven is what the studies all show. Right, but you, it eight. takes you I a could few go years seven, to. But if we were doing five on misdemeanors, we ought to at least have a little more on film. Yes, sure. Eight's good. Eight's good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Any felony, just. I don't know where the other problems lie. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> um, so next change is on page 16. This would be the waiting period to expunge that sealed offense. We're still talking about felony property crimes and mm -hmm. drug charges. Um, so the proposal from legal aid was to drop that waiting period to six years from 10 years from the date that the um, petition or from the date that the record was sealed. 
So original proposal from the Sentencing Commission was 10 years. Legal aid proposes dropping it to six. This is, this is proper felony level property crimes. Sta same I set of crimes. Eight, 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 eight. Where is it? Are, is this on line it's, 18? No, but I'm on, on I'm on right here. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, so that's eight. Okay. And then the next bracketed set of language, again, is that those yeah. different, should we take that out? I'm assuming yeah. the committee wants to take that out. Okay. So next is page 17. These are qualifying felonies. Um, so the original proposal from the Sentencing Commission was that seven years or 15 years had passed um, from the date of the satisfaction of the judgment to seal those records and Legal Aid proposed dropping that to seven years. Christ, they were on the commission, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're just giving us all of their proposals. Well, their proposal so, and putting them in here. So we can't have seven if we had seven for the other ones, right? So this should be a little bit higher. It should be. Maybe 10? Could be 10. Yeah. 10. Okay. For me, I mean, you know, yeah. obviously tomorrow <coughs> we'll listen to why it should be lower or higher. Okay. So bottom of page 17, we're still in these qualifying felony offenses. The original proposal from the Sentencing Commission was that these can only be sealed and aren't eligible for expungement. And the proposal from Legal Aid was that they would be eligible for expungement only if the respondent stipulated to that expungement of the record. Can I just no. back up a second to line 10? So we're seeing at least 10 years have elapsed since the date on which the person satisfied the judgment of the day before. The person committed a subsequent offense 10 years from the date on which the person satisfied the judgment for the subsequent offense, which was later. later. Mm -hmm. So if you do if you don't do anything bad it's ten years. If you do something bad it's ten, ten years plus whatever. They're both referring to ten years after satisfaction of the judgment for the subsequent. For the subsequent. So if you don't uh, if you if you Okay, all right. I I read this to be if you go three years without a new crime, you commit a new crime, now you gotta wait ten years from the time that the new crime does to satisfy the yeah. judgment of the old crime. And you might also be at the point where you can get the new crime yeah. expunged, but you have to wait 10 years. It to does, do one. you know, okay. Okay. I don't yeah. know what the word is, yeah. but it um, I got you. extends you out. Yeah. I think it's actually a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so do we want to make a decision there about whether or not no. these records? No. So the respondent is the state's attorney. Yeah. So I, I think the state's attorney is okay with, well, with the judgment. I, I see what happens here. The state's attorney's office is very, very busy. They say, okay, go ahead. I, I think, geez. Well, but that's up to, you know. Well, I mean, we have to, the, we need to take some responsibility for would you leave that bracket and I'd love to hear from the state's attorney for not here today. Sure. Well, the attorney general maybe can speak for the state's attorneys on this one. What do you think? Uh, could, could we check with John Campbell yeah. before we decide on this? Whether they're okay with it. Just this one line. So. Bottom of page 17. Yeah, is the yeah. attorney general okay with it? Um, the legal aid for yeah, I th I, we would be okay with it. The state's attorney's okay. <coughs> Let's hear from yeah. the state's attorneys. Yeah. It seemed to be me that you know, that's where you could. Well, the state's attorney's got the. Yeah, let's check with them. Yeah, well, we'll check with the state's attorneys if they're okay with your control. Yeah. Okay, so we'll leave that bracketed for now. Okay. And line 19. Oh, and this is the provision that if the if the respondent stipulates, um, then they the court can hold can grant the petition without a hearing. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the only issue that come, has come up with that 
a similar provision is, again, the old issue of surcharges. So now, in one of your other bills, you said we can waive surcharges, but it's based on an inability right. for hearing. But this seems to allow for a hearing, even if the parties agree that the case should be sealed, we'd still have to decide whether they have to pay surcharges in order to get it sealed. Yeah. So I just want the committee to. Okay. Right. Okay, we got in. Okay, so we'll move to page 18. We're in the, these are, this is the section of law that deals with sealing of juvenile records. Mm -hmm. And it would allow sealing of records um, of crimes that were convicted by a person who was under the age of 25 at the time. That, there was agreement on that, I think. And then um, what we left bracketed there on lines 12 and 13 were the provision that the court can order the sealing of those records if the person has not been convicted of a listed crime for 10 years prior to the application. So um, under existing law, right, Big 12 is encompassed oh, in those wait, listed where, crimes. Where are you now? I'm on page 18, lines 12 and 13. Okay, so all right, when you finish that, can we go back to line six? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay. Where are you? Do you want to talk about the age? I want to talk about the age. We decided 22. No, we decided 25. I think the proposal from the legal aid was 28, mm -hmm. and existing law is 21. We, we decided 25 Five. because the Vinny Giraldi Everything says 25, yeah. Right. OK. 20, oh, yeah, 25, not 28. Prior to attaining the age of no. 25. So it's people okay. 24 and under yeah. that are eligible for this. OK. okay. So the second part there that where the committee needs to make a decision is that under current law, um, the person can't have been convicted of a listed crime after that original crime that they're seeking a ceiling for. And this would provide that you can't commit a listed crime within 10 years prior to the date that you're filing for the ceiling. To seal your juvenile right? Yeah. Not seal the listed crime. Right, right. There's a big problem with this, the state attorneys or the attorney general of the court can talk to us about it tomorrow. Okay. So the next, can we move on? You yep. ready? So the next section where there's a change is section six. This is the um, marijuana. marijuana penalties. So the only change made to this section is on page 22. Remember we talked about that one four, we were talking about hashish. So it was just meant to be 1.4 ounces. And where did we talk about in this bill changing the word marijuana to cannabis? It's on the back. I don't know about that. Oh, no. So, so I think um, Eric had called me yesterday about you were putting something in the statutory revision. Right. You were putting it in the miscellaneous. Oh, that's right. Stuff. Yeah, I'm sorry. Wrong and, right. And I would say don't um, change it individually and other things. Would Like do it holistically because of all the definitions okay. and stuff. So you, we can don't throw that statutory okay. revision in any bills you want, but don't change it individually in the statutes okay. because okay. we have to do it throughout. Thank you. So nice. Okay, so we're now on page <laughs> on page twenty support section um, six. Where are we? Well, that's section six, and I and the only change to this section is in on page twenty two, when we're talking about um, knowing an unlawful possession of eight ounces oh, yeah, of marijuana right. or one point four ounces is of hashish. That's the correct amount. That's the correct amount. Yes. Okay. Can confirm that. And so the next change is on page 23, section 7. This is the expungement of marijuana criminal history records. Mm -hmm. And the, maybe, okay, well, maybe we'll one more minute here. Stop saying that word. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the last, this is the last section. Um, so the change here is to provide that the court shall order the expungement of criminal history records of violations of that statute that occurred prior to July 1st of 2020. And that change was intended to make it clear that we're only talking about um, criminal history records based on those violations and no other. So if you got a B&E at the same time. That wouldn't well, apply. Not 
Okay. And then the last decision that the committee needs to make is on page 26 about the effective dates um, based on the memo from the judiciary. I would suggest that we make an effective July 1, 2020, and that we add an appropriation one million dollars. Well, no, I think it was a little more than a million dollars. Yeah. I think forty thousand dollars. Uh, <laughs> does Terry want to update her amount, or would you be satisfied with it? Whatever we put in, the appropriations committee right. can take out as part of the regular budget, so it really doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, so I propose we put $47. <laughs> $47. Just to have an amount that raise up to appropriations. $1,075,000. Okay. $1,075,000. That's what, uh, if effective date is not postponed, we do not know whether we'll be able to comply with the proposed legislation as introduced. But in order to try to comply, we request additional FY21 appropriation of $1,075,000 with respect to expungement legislation as introduced over and above the FY21 budget requests that have already been submitted to each of the appropriations committees. Thank you very much. We will not be micromanaging the <laughs> we do that. The government operations micromanages the judiciary, not judiciary. Um, for those of you who didn't see the letter to Senator White, you may read the first. Sometimes we can put things in a better light for White. With that, um, We'll pick it up tomorrow morning. We'll schedule that. Where is it from? Yeah. Okay. We'll schedule that at uh, 8.45. Tom Hanks We're coming back. What time are we coming? Half an hour. We're on break until 10.30. 10.45. Oh, excuse me, 10.45. Thank you. Good morning. Good yeah. morning. Thank you for having me. I'm very appreciative of your interest in um, anything that might help vulnerable immigrant children. Um, I will tell you a little bit about myself. I'll just be brief. Um, I work at Vermont Law School. I teach mm -hmm. immigration law there, and I run the immigration clinic at the law school. And your name? And my name is Erin Jacobson. Um, I, th I think the best role I can play here this morning is to explain a little bit about exactly what special immigrant juvenile status is because it's kind of a confusing and unique statutory immigration scheme. Um, and then why it is that um, we need a bill regarding what otherwise might be seen as a federal Im immigration program. Um, and then if, of course if anyone has any questions. That's what I'm here for. Um, so special immigrant juvenile status, or SIJS, or SIJ, um, or as I like to call it, SIJ, just because it's a mouthful. Um, SIJ is an immigration program created by Congress to protect immigrant youth who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both parents. Um, and it was specifically written in, um, in its origin in 1990 to protect those kids who were deemed eligible for long-term foster care. It's since been expanded to um, include any child who might need protection because of abuse, abandonment, or neglect by one or both parents, not just those kids in, in state custody. Um, the way that the statutory scheme works is that the, the federal law requires juveniles to start in state court by requesting special findings. And then once the child obtains those findings, submitting them with their petition for special immigrant juvenile status. So it's kind of a unique statute that way in that it, it, it operates on this two-part system 
um, that starts with the state courts. And the reason Congress did it that way is because it felt that it's the state courts that really have the most expertise in making determinations about well-being, care, and custody of children. And then also because, as I mentioned, when the bill was first, when the statute was first passed, it was really about kids in foster care. So it only makes sense that the evidence that the child needs about the abuse, abandonment, or neglect um, comes from the state courts. So once the child makes these findings, then they can apply for the status. It's really still up to the federal government, up to the immigration agency, about whether to grant that status. So there is no immigration-related decision being made by the state courts. It's just that the state courts provide this evidence that supports the petition. The special findings that the child needs are pretty much threefold, um, and they are laid out in the bill. Um, I believe, right, they're delineated beginning at line 20 on page three. So it's that the child is either dependent on the court or um, is in the care and custody of the state. That's the first finding. The second finding is that reunification with the child's parent or both parents is not viable because of abandonment, abuse, or neglect. Can you give me an example? Sure. Sure. On B. On B. Yeah, I so um, I can give you a recent example from um, a case I had um, that where the children actually entered the United States with both parents, and then very soon thereafter, the dad just abandoned the entire family, including the kids, and, and never um, responded to any kind of correspondence, and never provided the family with any support whatsoever. So, so these are kids that weren't adopted by, by a, a family and then came to the United States. Like one of my neighbors has mm -hmm. a daughter who was adopted from Haiti. Right, they're, no. They're not, obviously not in this situation. No, because that, that child probably upon adoption becomes a U.S. citizen or, to, or gets the status of so the adoptive not, family. Okay. Right. right. So it's not, kids who, yeah. This is kids who come here maybe illegally? Yeah, some might enter unlawfully unaccompanied by anybody. Um, some might come with other family members escaping violence in their home countries or their own family situations. I was just trying to figure out mm -hmm. what Right, thank you. So the status does, um, its, its purpose is to protect these children from deportation where very likely they would be going back to the very abusive situation that the, the statute was written to protect them from. But it could be, they, they don't necessarily have to be here illegally. I mean, it could, nope. be, it could be That's right. people who came legally, Correct. but now have abandoned or abused or whatever the child. Correct, maybe yeah. they, yes, maybe yeah. they came um, with a, a family member who then is found not to be able to take care of them and their status would have relied on that parent um, that they can no longer live with. Yeah, just ask one question. You were mm -hmm. giving the example, yes. but where you were giving it with regard to B, mm -hmm. the reunification of the child with one or both of the child's parents was determined to not be viable. Correct. So if, if you still, if this person father abandoned the family, so the child still mm -hmm. has one parent. Mm -hmm. So that gets them in because they only have one parent left. Apparently they're not really, they've got one parent, so Correct. they still can come under this. They might be able to, yes, if, if, it, if the court finds that the child was abandoned, abused, or neglected by the other parent. Wow, so in this context, um, the example I'm talking about, we yeah. went to the family court on a parentage. Yeah. The mom needed an order saying, recognizing that she was the sole mm -hmm. custodial parent, um, and she also didn't have any status, legal yes, immigration I status. So she mm -hmm. was vulnerable to deportation, um, and then the question became, what about these children? Um, and so because the dad had abandoned the family, we were able to um, 
ask a state court for findings related to um, their abandonment by dad. But the, the, so the state court just found that there was abandonment or neglect or abuse. That's all they do is they, they find that. They don't have anything to do with immigration at all. They just find that and then, and then that. The, this language comes from the federal government, right? Correct. I mean, we can't change this language because it's, it is the requirements of the federal government. Then, then they go, then that gives them the ability to apply for the status at the federal government. And then the federal government decides whether they're going to give them the status or not. It's not. It's like applying for per, per, parole. You're not guaranteed just because you can apply for it doesn't mean you're going to get it. That is all okay. absolutely correct. Okay. And then, I mean, the state court also does have to find that third part that it's not in the children's best right. interest, right. yes, right. to be returned to their home country. Right. But these are all um, best interest determinations that our state courts make on a regular basis for other children too. Yes, yeah, correct. For all children. And that is exactly yeah. what Congress, um, why Congress, devised this program to start with right. the state court findings, right? Very good of them to do it that way. They don't usually they don't usually act in such um, a manner as to give states. Well, and that I, I, I shouldn't have said that maybe, but well, I no, they, I mean I I understand why you would be saying that. The Trump administration right now um, isn't a big fan of the um, the SIJ law as written, and sometimes um, where states are are providing protection for these kids, there is some pushback. Um, and to that end, you know, this bill might need a little bit of procedural tweaking. But to your point, this is the language mm -hmm. that comes right out of federal statute that the statutory scheme requires yeah. um, these juveniles to obtain from a state court. Um, I will say that in the example I just gave, we had a really hard time with the state court judge. Um, understanding that he had the authority to issue these findings. And so actually we appealed that to the Vermont Supreme Court um, where we won unanimously. And so primarily this bill is intended to codify what is already um, in state law through the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, the reason we want a codification of that is because it's just less squishy than case law and also because USCIS, the immigration agency, wants to see that these findings are coming from state courts through a process where the judge is hearing um, a case related to care and custody of children. And that, and that the findings also are accompanied by a citation to state law. That's really what the federal agency wants now. Yeah. So, um, Moving right along. Okay. okay. Um, so I don't, if anyone else has any questions about how the federal statutory scheme works, um, I'm happy to answer those, but I do, uh, yes. I'm concerned about the children 18 to 21, and that seems to be a special status. Right. And that actually, that's probably. Um, a section that um, would would need a little bit of tweaking. Um, it's the federal immigration. If that section wasn't here. Would that be okay? Um, yes, I would say yes. Be that, simply I mean, because I mean, given the we have until tomorrow mm -hmm. to vote a bill out, and if this needs tweaking, I would suggest we delete this section and try to. And then have them do it in the house. Well, if they, take, yeah. if, take yeah. or if, if it's know. necessary. Yes, sir. I think the guardianship you, section you that put does. Yourself in, where these kids have not committed a crime, and so they're in a special status. And then now you're 18 to 21, you're actually an adult under yeah. law. So. Right. So the federal statutory scheme, um, the federal statute, immigration statute, excuse me. Um, defines a child as anyone who is unmarried and under the age of 21. So technically, this kind of protective status is available for children up to the age of 21. Um, what states are trying to do is amend their statutes 
um, to make sure that all of these vulnerable kids don't age out of state court jurisdiction at the age of 18. And many states are doing it through the, their guardianship provisions. Yeah. That said, the Federal Immigration Agency doesn't like it at all. And so that particular section that um, uh, does start on yeah, page five might need, need, a, work, might need yeah. some more work, yes. I would suggest that we you know, just strike that. I think I would be okay with that. And you might hear from me again. The other thing that's about to happen is that um, the Department of Homeland Security has said it, it's going to, about to issue some regs related to, to SIJ. And so it, it might be wise to know what those regs are, in particular in relation to the over 18 um, situations, and then go from there. So I would suggest we start on page five, line five through to um, section five. It's a little sad for those kids who might benefit from that yeah, but, <laughs> section uh, but now, but we don't want it. for the other body to do it. Yes, yeah. yes. yes. I think time. that's really, that's really okay, prudent. So striking, okay. striking so, that right on the next page. What, what about the on the next page? On page six, what's going on? The only thing on page six we could say is the effective date. You can strike all of section Okay. Five. All of that. All of, yeah, section 3099 pertains to guardianships for oh, over 18 years. Uh, it it's still part of section. We just, um, we, we just um, revise section 4. That's all. May I ask one more question yep. about, about the bill itself? Mm -hmm. and this doesn't have to do with the special immigration status. But there is a section in here that um, makes immigration status a protected category. And I think that might raise some concerns. Uh, is that necessary for the special immigration status for kids? That is not necessary for, um, for special immigrant juvenile findings. Okay. No. Okay. That's a separate in, um, law. A, a amendment that right. has nothing to do with special immigrant juvenile status. I, I think that might raise some. Where, where, where are you going to? Bottom of two, top of three. Oh, okay. It's, it adds immigration status to. As a protected class. Yeah. 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 Um, for one thing, a lot of um, immigration status related things falls under national origin. Well, well, I'm suggesting that that might um, raise some unnecessary flags. Yeah. This, right, this right. special status for juveniles seems very straightforward, following federal law, doing what we have to do to protect the kids. So but you then would other try section three. I, I would. Yeah. yeah. I would. Just, I, I mean, it, it can be debated some other time, yeah. but it isn't connected to this issue. No, it really is. I, I'm not. A, I'm certainly not opposed to any state protections for immigrants. Right. Um, no, all I'm saying is it's separate yeah. and in addition to the SIJ. She did. Too, yeah. Yeah. She did. When they testified. Yeah. Senator Bennett. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, great. Are you, what, just, can you just review when did it start becoming an issue for um, the abandonment piece and it being considered to be um, people coming across the border now? In other words, children who get into the country. <coughs> in other words, somebody comes in now illegally, a child comes in with some adult, and then they're here. But they, they'll all qualify. Is that right? They should under the federal statute as written. Mm -hmm. As written, okay. It, assuming they, they can <coughs> get the state court finding about yeah. abandonment, abuse, yeah. or neglect, yeah. um, they still need to go before a state court that has jurisdiction yeah. over determinations about care and custody of children. Yeah. Um, they have to, that's that's the, a threshold requirement. Mm -hmm. And so I would guess that some states, it's gonna be harder to do to get those findings than in other states. I, I mean, mean just from different I judges. I think that's and true, courts. yes, yes. Um, not, the majority of states um, are issuing these special findings with mm -hmm. no problem, maybe they're adding um, statutory provisions or there's um, <coughs> Supreme Court holdings in those cases, but yes, some states uh, make it harder than others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, Appreciate it. Do you, so, do you, do you want to 
postpone until That'd be great. In some respects, these folks are more yeah, than I'm going last. Yeah. Thank you, just Senators. Yes. Uh, Emma, wait, what's your name? Emily? Sorry. No, Karen. <laughs> Karen. Aaron. 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 Sorry. Yes, that's okay. So, do you want me to sit? Yeah, why would you send it up to the. Just um, okay. so, so you're, you're, you're a professor at Vermont okay, so and you're, you're, you're also a practicing attorney. Sure. Sure. No, but somebody we already testifies voted to this on, on the floor. Oh, okay. Here, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yes, I work um, at the South Royalton Legal Clinic, which is Vermont Law School's legal clinic, and I handle the immigration caseload there. I should have added at the beginning that I also. Uh, through that work, because I do that work, I also contract with um, BCF to provide immigration representation for kids in I know custody. that caused okay. a lot of commotion, and then and when I you know start talking about the underlying bill, and if you do this, mention that at the start, <laughs> people got confused because we don't usually say that as a board to say that. To provide, when you say to provide. Well, I thought the amendment sure. was there. Council. Um, um, yeah, yeah council or representation, if we, if we, either, either if term is fine. If against the bill as okay. amended, okay. Okay. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Bill, and I, people, that's always the case, but people forget about it, so. I know. Then you, I was trying to avoid the bill. Yeah. Good morning. How are you? I'm getting my mojo back. Thank you. <laughs> I'm talking about yesterday. Oh, okay. No, no. I just thought I'd get ready for when you want to go. Thank you for being here. You're um, the chief of health and general's office. I think you've been here before. Yes, I've been here before on, on, on other issues, but also whenever there is an immigration uh, matter that's before the court. Just to, because we're short time, mm -hmm. the, any thoughts on this bill? Yeah. Uh, sure, uh, we we support the um, the intent and motive behind this bill, and also support passage of it. Um, and and, uh, and I agree with the suggestion today, which is to strike that section um, and then passage. As as Aaron pointed out, I just want to highlight that that recent administrative appellate decisions in the federal system, as well as the uh, anticipation of changes in the regulations on this uh, sp status is in the works. It happened in the late fall, October or November. And so uh, to the extent that there is more um, possibilities of sort of procedural or some slight, of, not substantive amendments on the other side after crossover to this bill, uh, that I anticipate that that may be possible. And the point being is that we certainly want to react in real time to anything that would be to relevant. Right, right. And, and What's a little confusing for me is this deals with both the probate division mm -hmm. and the family division. Mm -hmm. And I'm always confused by that because usually they don't work together. Um, many times, for example, um, grandparents will go to probate court to gain guardianship of their grandchild because of, usually because of the open trusts. Mm -hmm. And um, they never go to the family court, and then they complain because they're not getting help from DCF, and I say, well, you went to the wrong court, mm -hmm. and try to help them with that. But mm -hmm. that, in this case, you're dealing with both courts? I think, I think the way that I read this bill currently, it's focused on just the probate court. Uh, again, codifying that Supreme Court decision that Aaron talked about earlier. And as that case was presented to the Supreme Court, it was just a matter of arising out of probate court. But as Aaron uh, talked about, the, the findings that the state court needs to find uh, in order to qualify for the status in federal court, right, the, the, the custody and, and a dependency, the um, the viability of unification back with the parent and the best interest of the child. You know, those are matters that are the bread and butter of the Chin's proceedings and family courts. Right. So from, from our clients' perspectives, of course, the Defender General's mandate not being in the probate court, but in family courts, uh, as elsewhere across the country, SIG or SIG potentially eligible children come to our radar because we're representing them in the Chin's proceedings and it is a natural place for those findings to come because it's of course consistent with what the family judge is doing there, right? The best interest of the children, you know, deciding on, on the dependency matters um, and the viability of unifying with the parents. So 
So even though this bill is just limited to probate, it absolutely has uh, application in the family courts. Um, again, this is part of that, like, after crossover, is it possible to, for, for some suggested amendments? Um, you have to, I just want to give a heads up. We're absolutely supportive of passing it, but anticipate changes, yeah. Um, so confusing this now. bill does actually provide jurisdiction in the family court to oh, it these claims. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. So section, oh, okay. section one yeah. is yeah. amending the family court. So they're going to be working with the family court. Okay. Yeah, so in both of the statutory sections, the one that deals with the family division and the one that deals with um, the probate division, they both have concurrent jurisdiction in this language. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thanks for clarifying. So you most likely go to the family court. Or where do you start? I think it would where do you start on this? The case, mm -hmm. but, um, where does it start generally? I think I think it would start wherever you're already having a pending proceeding. So if you're already a child brought in through the chins. Yes, case, right. I get that. But say so, you're on the street, yeah. coming in new. Ken Schatz, um, Commissioner of the Department yeah. of Children and Families. I mean, I do think it depends. And again, I'm in learning mode here, so I do appreciate others okay. going ahead of me. Appreciate the conversation that maybe there will be some two weeks later. We're glad to participate in that. I think it depends frankly how the case starts mm -hmm. in what context and goes to Representative Nick some of Senator Nick sorry some of your questions that yeah. the, the, the reality is if there is a one parent um, who is still involved with the child in, in yeah. the scenario described by Ms. Jacobson that might go through probate okay. on the other hand if this matter has come to the attention of authorities or a mandated reporter mm -hmm. um, then it might go through the chins process okay. yeah. um, and so that will dictate um, the which court actually deals with it. At least that's my understanding mm -hmm. because and having concurrent jurisdiction just to say it out loud makes okay. sense to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. But again, we'll have to educate all of ourselves and our stakeholders to make yeah. sure they understand the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Any idea how many kids might be involved? You know, it is it is always the question out you know, for us we 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 rarely see the qualifying child because usually uh, you know, there is the reunification possible with a parent, right? So not all three, th three requirements are found. Or there is ultimately an adoptive family in the wing. I was under that. You know, yep. I, I guess I got confused about the goal of this bill because mm. and that's very, really been helpful today. Because I was under the impression, and I, back when I ran a group home. Unknown caller. Unknown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Scam. Hopefully. Um, I was on. Uh, I thought it was people who had been adopted and came to the mm -hmm. United States, and then it frequently happens, and we've seen it in a number of cases where the, the parents aren't able to handle the kid. They mm -hmm. give the child, you know, either DCF comes in, or they even uh, try to undo the adoption. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been true of, you know, I know I had a kid from Honduras at one time. And, uh, he had been through an awful lot in Honduras, and then his, the people who adopted him couldn't handle him. And, um, I still keep track of him, and he's doing very well, by the way, in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had another kid um, that was from, I can't think, I don't know if it was Mexico or Guatemala, but had a similar situation, and he, he actually um, stopped me one day at a gas station and, Rutland. I thought he was going to yell at me for something. And uh -huh. I didn't recognize him. He said, thank you for saving my life, which was really something. But there's another kid who spoke very broken English and had never, you know, really had a tough time. I'll tell you, it's true. He the, may the, have been in this situation. I'm not sure. His case may have been one where he had those kids. Um, those, those, no, those cases are just the most compelling stories, and that's what's amazing about having the status available, is that it is a pathway. Uh, to one of the questions earlier concerns, what if we have all of a sudden a mass arrival of undocumented children over the Canadian border? Um, what does that mean? Well, I think the point of how the whole design of this federal immigration status is set up, it's a case by case, yeah. right? And, and, and also, uh, we have to look at the individual circumstances as to, again, not just our, do that with their legal status, is it undocumented, but. Well, they found their way into DCF, but back then it was SRS custody. Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, um, so. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I can see that the, those cases, Dick, certainly might, a child who's brought into this country to be adopted and it doesn't work yeah. out, and 
DCF gets them. Mm -hmm. Very, com it's very it's common. Very common. Very common. Well, it could apply but to them. It would Professor, apply to them. But Professor Jacobson said that they've already, Maybe. like my neighbor's child from Haiti has already been become a U.S. citizen by being adopted. Maybe by not, them. though. Some but people don't can file I, for it. Yeah, I can give a, an example of one of my juvenile clients. Yeah. She, her grandmother tried to adopt her, yeah. um, but because of international adoptions are so incredibly difficult and there's all kinds of rules depending on the country of origin, she actually still, four years later, hasn't been able yeah. to adopt. Mm -hmm. And so for that grandmother to be able to go to the probate court and have a guardianship, yeah. um, and then for us to get special yeah. findings from the probate court means the child is safe from deportation mm -hmm. and the grandmother has decision-making capabilities um, and is safe from the parents entitlement. Yeah. I mean, there, there, I, don't, I have two kids right now. I'm, I'm trying to move this so Yeah. Long. No problem. Okay, thank you. I don't have anything else. I just You're welcome. What oh. was the initial initial what? date? Initial date passed. 1990. Did I write that down correctly? Okay. Just wondering. Good, good, good okay. detail. Thank you. And, sure. You seem to know a lot more about this. I'm learning. Ken, Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I will say that we are definitely supportive of, of moving forward with this. We do appreciate, again, the opportunity to, to review detail um, with others who are more knowledgeable. And, and obviously, we are in, in the child protection mode, and so protecting vulnerable children is part of our mission. So we want to be supportive. We recognize, though, also our lack of expertise or knowledge about immigration. And so, in fact, just to be straightforward with the whole committee, we have um, retained Professor Jacobson um, on a couple of cases to help us uh, work through issues related to immigration and some of the children that we're involved with. Um, and so from our perspective, it does make sense to have uh, vehicles to enable to have these kind of findings made as appropriate. It's obviously uh, the, the, the findings related to abuse, neglect, and abandonment, and potential reunification is, are the kind of opinions and analysis that we do provide on a day-to-day -day basis in the CHINS process. Uh, we're not typically in probate court. Um, so, you know, again, I want to learn a little bit more about how that might work and how that might involve uh, our staff, if at all. But the point being, we definitely want to support um, these vulnerable children uh, as appropriate. And so from our perspective, it does make sense to proceed. Go ahead to answer questions you have for me. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Pretty straightforward. Um, we prepared a... How time consuming be for you to do a strike call version of this? Um, I could do it over the lunch hour. Could you do it in the next 30 minutes? Okay. You're taking, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just taking out section three and section, and the probate, yeah, the guardianship yeah. section. Um, We're not changing any wording, we're just taking out two sections. Uh, oh, we could yeah. vote on that and see if I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about trying to arrange time for, for yeah. staff because you've got many other committees. Yeah, um, I can, I can work only, on it right we now. We only get you for. Um, I think I probably would need editing to look at yeah, it. Oh, that's oh no, no, no. I'm just, uh, we can vote on a rough draft. We can vote okay. on a rough draft. Okay, um, so I can get it to you probably in the next half an hour or so if I can get okay. editing we, to If we okay. came back at, at uh, 10 minutes of 12. Okay. Okay. And then we'd have a rough draft to look at, sure. a new draft, and then the final you can do tomorrow, we'd get it to whoever. I'd like to be able to vote this out today and not have it. Yeah, even if it isn't edited. Okay. That'd be okay? Yeah. I don't want to push you back. But I know it's only my committee you're interfering with. Don't worry it's just the capital bill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's all. That's a minor uh, little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll get that. Okay, right. thank you. Thanks. So Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, this is a strike all amendment of, um, I uh, struck out section three, which was um, putting in immigration status to the protected categories. Um, so the new section three is the, the new subchapter 14 on special immigration status. And then the, the second change was in this section of law, I struck out um, section 3099, which was going to be the section on the 18 to 21 year old um, guardianship piece of the language. Right. 
And that, could you give us the draft number? Yeah, we're having some, some DM problems, so it's draft number 1.1. I'll, I'll add that into, it didn't automatically update, it looks like, but I'll add that into the Senator Batty moves that we um, amend S 316 as seen in draft 1.1. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And Senator Benning further moved that we report S 316 favorably as amended. Any discussion? None, Peggy, would you please call the roll? my vote's been determined. <laughs> huh? I said, I guess my vote's been determined. Oh, no, I don't. That's okay. No, I, I thought you were moving the bill when you asked for the draft. No, I just wanted to run the draft. That's okay, don't no, just keep going. Peggy, would you please call the roll? Senator Benny moves, yes. <laughs> 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 Well, I didn't think there was much opposition given the discussion earlier. Please call the roll. Senator White, yes. Senator Brewer, yes. Senator Benning, yes. Senator Nicka, yes. Senator Benning, yes. Yes. Senator Sears, yes. yes. And who's the reporter? Senator Nicka has volunteered yes. to report the bill. Yeah. I, there was one Thank one you one. all very much.